All right, Michael, welcome back to the Avenue History Podcast for this bonus episode. Thanks for having me, Matthew. We are talking about your forthcoming book, 1922, which is a, a kind of a sequel of sorts to 1919. But I, I'm curious because I think, if, if I understand this correctly, your 1919 book was basically a, a slimming down and, and rewriting of your dissertation, like funneling it down to a shorter book, right? For Popularizing for mask- it. Popularizing it. Did you think when you wrote that book that you were going to write follow-up books? Well, I did not. I, I didn't. I thought this was a one-off, and I would be moving on in new directions. So I, I really, Matthew, did not see this book coming. But in a way, maybe I should have seen it coming because I'll, I'll be honest with you. When, when I was doing my doctoral work, I wanted to do a broad treatment of Adventism and fundamentalism, and George Knight who had the privilege to work with, he basically told me, he said, Michael, you got to shorten your topic and make it manageable so you get done. You've got the rest of your life to do work on Adventist <laughs> history in the 20th century especially, which is what you want to mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. So just do this and then <laughs> yeah. and have fun, basically. Have a nice life and write <laughs> as much about Adventist history as you can. And so I've, I guess you could say I've always wanted because I'm interested in the broader motifs sure. of what this book brings up. And in a way, uh, even though I didn't kind of plan it this way, uh, it, it kind of falls naturally in that direction. And in some ways, I'm finally exploring the stuff I really wanted to get to, oh my goodness, like 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Was there a moment when you were, when you were doing the 1919 book uh, or maybe after when you were talking about it at camp meetings, when you realized, I want to keep going with this? Well, yes, because some of these issues with 1919, how we interpret inspired writings are really important. So I talk about 1919, how it's polarized and there's different ways of interpreting inspired writings and uh, all of those kinds of things are sort of the, but there's sort of the rest of the story, the aftermath, what happens next. Mm. And so there's kind of a natural segue to to want to, and I, I had had some like teasers, I guess you'd say, where I had found little bits and pieces along the way, things that were clearly tantalizing to me. And I wanted to explore them more, but I'll be honest until COVID kind of hit the last two years, kind of forced me to, you know, I'm just home. I'm a, I'm a religion teacher. I'm stuck at yeah. home teaching online classes and uh, I can't go to any archives or anything. I'm just stuck. And so it forced me to read through the old reviews, the old signs, Watchmen magazine, the old fashioned way, page by oh page. My goodness. And I had a lot of fun doing that. And I can't say I've read every word on every page, but but just slowing down and then really absorbing some of this. And then I started seeing aha moments where I was like, mm. oh my goodness, how did I not know this? How did I miss this, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you've got 1922 coming out. Uh, this is going to be centering, I'm, I'm guessing from the from the name on this, on this pivotal general conference session in 1922 where Daniels is voted out of office or, well... You know, right. he, he does a little switcheroo <laughs> with, with Spicer. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I subtitle it The Rise of Adventist Fundamentalism. I, I like that, you know, because we just had the rise of Skywalker. Is there any connection there? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I got to gotta tie in some Star Wars and Adventist history, Matthew. <laughs> there we go. Now, can't, can't help it. That's right. That's right. There, everything is connected. Is, is, there, uh, <laughs> is, this a, is this the stopping point? Or are we going to go beyond 1922 even? Yes, and yes, the <laughs> I, I would like to see, I'd like to see pushing, because here's the thing, is I just put this 1922 book together, and I kept finding more stuff. Yeah. There's more there. And so, honestly, the 1922 book is just like a highlights reel, mm-hmm. where I've included some stuff that I found that I felt was really important, but I have enough already for a third volume whether that will come out exactly as a trilogy or just a, it will be a completely different volume, I don't know. I haven't figured that out, what I want to do next. And, and you and I have been talking about this a little bit, right? So mm-hmm. getting ideas and publishing and how do we disseminate research that we're working on to, to, to get that, those ideas and the best research that's coming along and getting that out there so people can, 
can get it, have access to it and digest it, the, these ideas, because these ideas are really important. They matter a great deal for Adventist identity today. So right. um, I, I'm not sure, but I, I have a lot more that's there. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. 1922, one of the things you see race and gender, I really, I have a whole chapter on gender. I've kind of siphoned off the chapter on race and I've made that a separate article and publishing elsewhere. Um, and so then, uh, so I, I've got these two motifs, um, but the one that just blew me away is the 1920s is truly the era where last generation theology comes into its own. Mm. So whatever that next volume looks like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably subtitle it The Paradox of last generation theology because it's okay. it's part of Adventist identity. We believe Jesus is coming. There will be a last generation, but we um, the paradox is this fundamentalism and perfectionism and where we have to do it ourselves. And uh, of course, M. L. Andreessen is famous for teaching these things. You know, ten twenty years later, in some of his writings, but long before Andreessen was a thing in Adventism, last generation theology was on the rise. And it clearly was happening in the 1920s. And whatever comes next, it's going to have to, in some way, engage with the what I you know the genesis or the development of of last generation theology. And that's probably the most significant thing. And that's still yet to come. Now, for someone who may be listening, who's like, "What's last generation theology?" Can you give them a little kind of a, a brief one sentence? What is what is that all about? Why is that a big deal? Yeah, so um, George Knight and several other uh, theologians and historians in the church have kind of highlighted uh, in the 1930s and 40s, M. L. Andreas in the leading theologian of the Adventist church, and he'll later become a big dr part of the drama of the 1950s with questions mm -hmm. on doctrine and feeling really upset about that. But he articulated in his commentary on Hebrews how right at the very end of time after the close of probation, there will be a generation that are absolutely sinless and stand without a mediator. Mm. And so this idea of having to make yourself perfect so that you can withstand the final onslaught and and basically prove to the universe that... Um, and so the whole center of the great controversy then falls upon those people being perfect at the very end of time. And in a way, they're kind of bringing on the on the end, on mm -hmm. Jesus being able to come by being perfect enough, right? So that's this sort of last generation theology. It takes several ideas, several quotes by Ellen White, uh, but it takes them out of context. It takes these ideas um, in a very... Um, uh, I, I would argue aberrant, but a, a very unhelpful kind of way. Um, so what is, you know, because we need to be ready for Jesus to come. These are all yeah. the very important things to our Adventist identity. The, the crux of it all is when we make the plan of salvation not about Jesus, but about ourselves. And yeah. that's where it's problematic. And so last generation theology. Now, recently, several critics have pointed out and said, well, they didn't actually use the term last generation theology. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They didn't use the term, the words. That's kind of a later term that just like we we do this all the time with other things, right? We yeah. use later terms to describe earlier ideas like Trinity. and movements. Yeah. That's another good one. Um, how they would have termed it in the 1920s was the victorious life, mm. living the victorious life. And so uh, probably a more historically accurate way of putting it would be victorious life Adventism, because they're talking about how to have that victorious life for Christ to come. I and see. so once you see that lens, you see it all over the place in the 1920s. Uh -huh. It's just pervasive in the 1920s. Both the review, the signs have whole editorial departments called the victorious life. So, mm. you know, it, it's there. It's there. Yeah. So th this is really interesting. I mean, I'm sure many Adventists who are listening have, have heard of last generation theology. They're getting it. But I think in, in many people's minds, last generation theology is this thing that becomes really big in the 50s and following, and it's kind of like the, the origins of it, though, are rather murky. So I, I don't want to get mm -hmm. too much into whatever book you have next about this, because we're <laughs> excited about it. We want to, uh, you know, it, it's nice to kind of figure out where are the so roots fast, of this Matthew. thing. Yeah, yeah. Where are the roots <laughs> of this thing? We're just going to keep going. Well, and that's uh, my 1922 book, right? That's that's yeah. really what we're getting into. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I think that's that's what's really intriguing about this. I know when we went through this time period in the in the in the podcast, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't go into it as in depth. I didn't read every issue of the review, <laughs> but I, I think what's interesting is a lot of the things. I think what what Avenus today will figure out 
is that a lot of the things they take for granted as Adventist, as it's part of our normal and orthodox practice, doesn't so much have its roots in the pioneering generations of the church, but in these first few decades of the 20th century. Is that an accurate thing to say? Yeah, you know, what a lot of people will call, you know, the sort of um, more conservative and, and those that really espouse last generation theology today, um, you have the those kinds of, um, because history is complex, right? It's, it's, it's just really complex. It's not exactly the same today. There's contingency, there's agency, um, things. And so, um, but recognizing those things, um, when, when I, you know, th those that kind of tout a more perfectionistic kind of Adventism and last generation theology, what I, what I really hear them saying is the Adventism they want to go back to is not the 1860s mm -hmm. or the 1880s. It's the 1920s. Yeah. It's the 1920s. Yeah. And this, so mm -hmm. it's probably one of the most significant decades in all of Adventist history. Yeah. Uh, and yet it's probably the least studied of, of those various uh, turning points, if you please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely the roaring 20s for a completely different reason <laughs> with <laughs> fundamentalism. Um yeah. So I mean that um, makes sense. That makes sense how you 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 know you're going to cover you covered this in 1919 now 1922 and perhaps uh, another book that's going to be rooted in the 1920s as well. This is what I hear you saying critical for Adventists to understand because it's it's like a it's like a gap in our collective memory. We we understand the 19th totally. century, we understand the 1800s and we understand mm -hmm. a little bit of our more recent modern age. But mm -hmm. this is just like a black hole. One of the things you point out in the 1922 book here is is this kind of creed making not creed making but statement of beliefs yeah. uh you know we obviously have it with Uriah smith we have a first edition of it you know back way back when in the mm -hmm. 1870s but yeah but it's it's not just the it's not we often just look at we go from like eight what is it 1874 or something with smith mm -hmm. all the way to the, mm -hmm. to yeah all the way up to 32 and we like there's nothing in between but you found that there's actually a, a few statements in between that began in the late 19 teens, right, and into the 1920s, yeah. or maybe began in the 1920s, I should say. And so Absolutely. there's this there's this process here in the 1920s of like, what is it that we believe, and how do we define this? And right, we're making mm -hmm. these statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is great because the 1870s. What's going on in Adventism, right? So you got Uriah Smith, you've got James White, and they're having these intense dialogues with the Advent Christian Church and with Seventh-day Baptists, those who were most common, you know, belief in the Second Advent and the Sabbath, these, these commonalities, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're actually exchanging delegates. For the Seventh-day Baptists, it goes really, really well. They actually exchange um, delegates at general conference sessions. Um, with the Advent Christian Church, with uh, Miles Grant, it doesn't go so well. Miles Grant kicks James and Ellen White off the campground and, and says, basically, don't ever come back. <laughs> oh. And he spends the rest of his life attacking Ellen White. So the whole Advent Christian dialogue just really goes south, um, and and it's it's most unfortunate. But but it's those interactions that cause church leaders to say, oh well, we kind of need to have a, a explanation of what we believe because we we're against creeds, and mm -hmm. most Protestant churches would have define themselves, hey, we, we don't believe in creedalism. You know, that's sort of the this American uh, religious kind of. Um, you know, in the heyday of the Christian connection and restorationism, we don't want to get tied down with creeds. So this is kind of, it's not, Adventists are not unique in that respect. They're kind of part of this, this populist kind of element. Let's not get bogged down with creeds. But, but they start basically having to define Adventist fundamental beliefs, which is, if we're really honest, that's kind of creeds, right? That's, you, yeah. all it is is an articulation of what you believe. What Adventists don't like is that it becomes rigid and formal. That's how they, that's the part of creed making they don't like. But the idea that you actually explain your beliefs is something that's very normal and that our pioneers found very helpful. Now, the missing link between 1872 and 1931, when we have our first statement that appears in the yearbook and sets off through the 20th century, is there's an in between period that every Adventist historian scholar that's looked at this has has glossed or missed and that and, and it shocked me because slowing down I started finding this stuff um, in 1919 1920 1921 um, where and and it's clearly a reaction to the historical fundamentalists 
Mm. And the fundamentalists are having to produce statements of faith. Most of them are the, the five fundamentals on the, you know, on the virgin birth of Christ, the atonement and the inerrancy of the Bible and so on. Um, so they're having to define that because they want to define themselves against the modernists. So this pulse, there's this huge pulse within fundamentalism. And as Adventists interact with the fundamentalists who are doing this, producing these statements of faith, they're like, wait a minute, we need to define what we believe in conjunction with what the fundamentalists are doing because there's these interactions. They're having to engage and define who they are juxtaposed with this historical fundamentalist movement. And so there's these series of statements of belief. Um, I wouldn't say that they're copied from the fundamentalists, but it's clearly in reaction to the, what the fundamentalists mm -hmm. were doing. And all of them have this basic order where they're dealing with the same list of major beliefs that the fundamentalists. And so they're kind of like, here's the same kind of thing. And oh, by the way, here's all the unique extra things that Adventists believe too. And so you have a series of these beliefs, these statements of fundamental beliefs. First time I see that really being um, used that terminology in that way, you'll see lists of beliefs, slightly different terminology, often very close, but actual fundamental beliefs. And uh, one of the leaders of that was F.M. Wilcox, who attends these fundamentalist prophecy conferences. He's a major force in all of this. And later in 1931, he's the one that is the lead person in the 1931 list of fundamental beliefs that appears in the Adventist yearbook. But that basic list is basically um, essentially the same with a slight tweaking, but it's essentially the same as what he had developed all the way back in 1920, so more than a decade earlier. And mm. so what that shows is that the fundamental beliefs and this pulse of creating statements of fundamental beliefs is directly tied to this historical fundamentalist movement and this whole thing of fundamentalism. And that's a lacuna that, that just no one's made that connection before. So I think that's a significant contribution. And, and by the way, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, explaining what we believe to others sure. is a very good thing. Uh, but we do need to know and understand the historical context out of which that arose. Yeah, because I think the, uh, we, 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 we like to fool ourselves as Adventists in thinking, well, we're just kind of doing this stuff in a vacuum. We're not influenced by the world, including the religious world around us. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we're just making these decisions as we see fit, purely reasonable, purely led by, you know, and, and it's like, but, but you know, you're not because you, you see, I mean, you've, you've explored these ties between the capital F fundamentalists. I know this word gets thrown around a lot and right. applied to like everybody <laughs> that somebody disagrees <laughs> with. Um, right. But and that's a problem because a lot of people don't get fundamentalism and they just see it as a pejorative thing. And what I'm trying to do is take this as a historical movement and studying it um, and its interactions historically speaking. So right. this is not – my research isn't saying, oh, I'm trying to call out people. You're a fundamentalist to gotcha. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's, that's not what this is about. Yeah. Well, I mean my experience – I'll just switch gears. My experience yeah. with the word, when I first heard it, it was pejorative before right. it was historical. Uh, right. Back in the days of America Online – I used to get into the Catholic chat room, and that's with <laughs> confession time. <laughs> confession time, yeah. And anyways, you know, when we would get into these, uh, we'll call them discussions. Uh, you know, they were all oh, look. The fundamentalists are back, and not just me, but some Baptists and other people who are in there causing trouble. And it's like, right. you know, we we're called fundamentalists, and I didn't understand what the word was then. I just knew it was something you didn't want to be because they were calling me that. Um, <sighs> You know, and it's like, boy, this word really needs to be rescued for historical purposes because it actually applied to a group of people. And, you know, and it wasn't just it, later on it became a pejorative, but it's actually a useful word to understanding this period of history. And we have exactly. to understand what it really means. So I but the interesting thing, I think, is that Avenus applied this word to themselves, didn't they? Oh, my, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to find an Adventist from after the death of Ellen White up until 1930 who see fundamentalism as anything except the very best of what Adventism should and is. Mm. And that's the that's the crazy thing, Matthew. And, uh, you know, A.G. Daniels gets up at the 1919 Bible Conference and extols, um, you know, uh, William B. Riley and others who are well known historically as, as part of that historical fundamentalist movement as icons and as sort of 
models, role models for what Adventism needs and should should be. So, um, and finally, you get to the point where you know Adventist authors are like, you know, we are the true fundamentalists. That's right. And then some, a whole series of people <laughs> say, you know, we're the fundamentalists of the fundamentalists, you know, because if, <laughs> if, if people really took their reading of scripture, a literal reading of scripture and took it seriously, these fundamentalists would have to start keeping the seventh day Sabbath because they believe in a literal creation and, and all of that. So if you believe in the Bible as inerrant and, and so on, then you have to believe in a literal creation. If you believe in literal creation, you have to believe in the seventh day Sabbath. So it's very logical, right? very logical. But, I mean, did Adventists purely see fundamentalism as, as a theological thing, or did they participate in what fundamentalists are known for in terms of their militancy, their kind of combativeness with culture around them? Well, of course they did, right? I mean, and I've been sharing with you some of my fun cartoons I've been finding. There's literally <laughs> hundreds of these things where they're, you know, so they're fully engaged in the culture wars going on around them. They see uh, this as a threat to Christianity and to specifically Adventist beliefs. So, um, and, and that means that the, the same things the fundamentalists were doing, purifying and, and looking for the orthodoxy of missionaries overseas and of teachers in schools. Those were the two fronts where they were really, the battle lines were drawn. We have to double down and make sure. And I tell the story at the beginning of the book that I first found, you know, a long time ago, uh, and wrote up uh, about um, the Adventism's first generation of historians of, of E.F. Albertsworth and El and so on. They basically get kicked to the curb because they, you know, they're they're accused of being Jesuit Catholic yeah. infiltrators, sympathizers, right? And so, oh, we we caught you, and and uh, they get kicked out. Uh, and and that mentality of having to protect the faith from those who are perceived as less orthodox or less faithful is is a pulse you find in the wider historical fundamentalist movement. Uh, and you certainly see that happening within Adventism. And, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, the earliest rumors of Jesuits infiltrating the church really dates back to this 1920s period. That's a topic that needs a lot more exploration. Uh -huh. uh, but and I think it's a lot of fun, right? You know, these the whole conspiracy theories and stuff. Where yeah. this all comes I mean, not from. for Albert's work, um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't for him. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I know there's several that are, are taking up these themes and, and moving with them in some fun new directions. And, yeah. uh, and, and another one of the, those, and I don't want to get ahead of you, but another good example of this uh, kind of militantly needing to defend the faith is, is that they f saw themselves under siege, under threat. You know, they have the Bureau of Investigation, the precursor of the FBI. I, I found that stuff because it's in the minutes of the 1919 Bible Conference. And I reference it in my dissertation, but at that time, those materials were still restricted. You couldn't mm -hmm. access them. But uh, surprise of surprises, several years ago, a couple of good historians, Jeff Rosario and Kevin Burton, um, they had applied to get those things declassified or whatever, and, and they were successful in doing that. So they were able to do what mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do. And this shows you how research kind of builds off of one another, right? right? You know, as more sources become available and, and they've gone that down that rabbit hole to great length. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've just highlighted basically once again in my 1922 book, some of the stuff that I had found a long time ago. Um, and I certainly acknowledge and appreciate how others have kind of picked up that mantle because I just think that's that's utterly fascinating that yeah. here they are under surveillance by by the the federal government who are watching over. Are you loyal enough? Are you patriotic mm -hmm. enough? And and by the way, this this whole, this prompts a whole surge of Christian nationalism, of patriotism, of of Adventists having having to prove that they are yeah. loyal, patriotic. Americans and and here's the crazy thing, Matthew is there's all these articles in the review. There's a, a patriotic, um, you know, war uh, department in in church periodicals on a number of them, and they have articles titled like 100% Americanism. Oh my! What you can do to be to prove your basically your loyalty to America by eating less um, imports from overseas from certain parts of the world. So there's one that's eat less sugar. And it's not because Ellen White says the health message is good. It's because you can prove your patriotic loyalty. And, and, and here's another one. Here's a kicker, right? Is, is this whole thing about, um, flags and churches. So this whole thing about, uh, flags and churches, uh, clearly ties back to, 
uh, World War I and this government surveillance and having to prove that Adventists are truly loyal, uh, uh, they're, they're loyal Americans. And so you have all these things in church periodicals and, and, and that's when you start looking around in pictures and you can clearly see a shift where Adventists are putting flags in American churches. And, <laughs> and here's, here's the other one is that, you know, I'm writing about the 1922 General Conference session. If you look at the pictures that have survived from that 1922 GC, looking in, you see American flags all over the place. Mm. So they're having to prove, as, as the church is becoming an increasingly global church, but, but it's ironic because here um, they're draping themselves yeah. in American flags um, to prove their, uh, you know, the, their Americanness. And I, I love that because this is just how research is. You build on the research of others. You find something, other people, you know, new sources become available that maybe weren't accessible. Uh, in the past, and and this is the fun of history is is yeah. where we're able to 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 continue pushing <laughs> those uh, boundaries and our historical understanding in, in new directions. It's just it's it's hilarious to me because it's like, you know, Revelation thirteen, the land beast is America, slavery is a sin, da 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 da. Oh wait, the Bureau of Investigation is looking into us. Quick, put up American flags. We're patriotic. Stop eating sugar. Woo, America! It's like, this is the people, this is a group of people who are like, we are ready for the end times, we will undergo persecution, we will be faithful until the end. Oh wait, they're asking questions about us? Quick! <laughs> it's like, put up some flags. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what happened, you know? I mean, that, if we're serious. And, <laughs> and, and, and it raises good questions that we still wrestle with today, you know? I mean, th there's all these culture wars going on within um, our culture and society now, and even within Adventism. You yeah. know, uh, talking about politics and 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 how do we how do we deal with these kinds of things? And and what's great about history and Adventist history, you can look back a century ago and we're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they were having the same kinds of problems. And then we can maybe talk about them historically. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to politics and faith, um, this is why I keep telling my students, you know, our faith has to inform our politics and not our politics informing our faith. I, I think that's a good lesson. That's a takeaway from this time period in the wake of World War One, that actually has a lot of resonance with what's happening around us at this current moment. Yes, yes. So guys, this book, as you, if you can't tell from this short conversation, this book, we're going to talk about patriotism in the FBI. We're going to talk about Jesuit spies. We're going to talk about, we didn't even really get into the inspiration of Ellen White here or gender or, you know, I mean, there's, there's so, so much, much going here. on in this book, guys. Michael, if, if somebody wants to pick up 1922, it's not out yet. Any word on when it might be available? Well, it should be coming out very, very soon. Uh, I was going over proof pages this last week, and I expect it to be out in May. So it will be available through Adventist Book Centers. It should be available on Amazon, on Kindle. And so, uh, in fact, I'm told very, very soon there should be a links going up. Uh, so that people can pre-order it. As soon as as soon as we do that, we can maybe even drop a, a link to that in the show notes or something. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. And of course, we'll let you know on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. If you are following the Avenus History podcast, we'll let you know when it comes out as well. By the way, in the meantime, you can go check out Michael and Greg Howell's podcast, Avenus Pilgrimage. They just did an episode on vaccines, which I'm sure will not be controversial at all. Not at uh, all. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a topic a topic that a few years ago you could talk about and everybody would think was boring mm -hmm. uh, is suddenly like cutting edge controversial. So, you know, good on you guys for tackling that. Uh, but anyways, they post about the first of every month. You can go listen to Avenus Pilgrimage. And, uh, and you can also just, of course, stay here toward the end of the month on the 22nd when we are going through our series on the uh, questions on doctrine and that controversy. So I guess we're all stepping in it these days. <laughs> Anyways, Michael, thanks so much. We're looking forward to reading 1922 when it comes out in a few months. All the best, my friend. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs>